Groove. It had been about a month since the last time we talked to Howie Roseman and Nick Sirianni. We finally heard from those guys on Wednesday. Yeah, and I think the best thing about it was they weren't together. Like last time we talked to them, they were on the podium together. It's kind of awkward, and they would look at each other, and, and you didn't really get great answers from either one. It's not an ideal setup, um, and it was all virtual. So um, I thought today was a lot more illuminating, and uh, certainly we got we got some good little nuggets, especially from Howie. Yeah, we did. We'll get into all of that. This is Eagle Eye Podcast with Ruben Frank. I'm Dave Zangaro. I'm out here in Indianapolis. It was, uh, it was, you're right. We got more out of this than we did from the virtual session after the year. And honestly, so much of that, we talked about it on the last pod, but so much of that press conference was looking back at the 2021 season. This was really kind of looking ahead uh, at what this team has, what they need to do. And as always, I think we have to start with the quarterback position. Um, they said it again. I mean, they went about as strong as they could go on saying Jalen Hurts is their guy. Now, you can believe them. You can not believe them. You can think that it, at some point if Russell Wilson becomes available or Deshaun Watson, that, that situation clears up. You can think that maybe they'll pursue another quarterback. But I get the sense that this isn't lip service from them. They really believe in Jalen Hurts, and they believe that he can continue to grow. What's your read on it? Yeah, I really got that sense. And you can't always tell when someone's lying or misleading you. You, you know, sometimes sometimes you really don't have a good sense of it, but I, I it seemed genuine, you know. And Nick at the end of Nick's presser, he was asked about what Jalen needs to improve on. And man, he spoke for like how long was his answer, Dave? Like three and a half minutes just on talking about his accuracy, his arm strength. Um, uh, his playmaking ability, reading defense, just it was very, it was a very thought out, honest, uh, balanced uh, answer um, about his strengths and and where he needs to get better. And as I listen to him, I'm, I'm thinking to myself, this does not sound like a guy who is looking to replace this quarterback that he's talking about. Um, I mean, they speak with reverence about Jalen Hurts and um, and his ability. And, you know, there's constant reminders. This is a 23-year-old kid um, who who led the team to the playoffs. Uh, and that's how they're thinking. And I, I agree. I do think if, if something comes available that is at a price that I don't really anticipate, but you never know, things can happen. Uh, I don't think – um, they would, they would, you know, say no. I think they would listen to anything. And I think any team would. You do your due diligence. But I'll tell you what. I, when I listen to Nick, especially, but both of them, Nick and Howie, they sure seem set on Jalen Hurts being their quarterback, and they seem really excited about it too. Yeah, and and we're not talking about for the next decade, really. I mean, we're talking about next year. Um, the the one theme that I keep coming back to when these guys talk about hurt is the growth potential. You know, that's, it, I think we all agree that he's not good enough right now. Right. I mean, I don't think anyone would disagree with that. He's not good enough right now to say he's the guy for the next decade or so, but, um, and, and they bring up valid points that he has shown growth. I mean, he's shown growth from his time in Alabama to Oklahoma. Nick, Nick brought this up himself and, and from Oklahoma to year one, year one to year two. Um, I guess the question becomes, you know, what's the ceiling here? Is it, is it a high level starter in the league? I, I don't know the answer to that, but it, and I don't know if the growth progression stays on the same track. If it does, then I think he can be a pretty good quarterback. Um, but it, it's, they're looking at him with potential and they're, they're looking at him like a 23 year old kid who wants to get better. And, and we've talked about this before. I mean, it, if he fails in the NFL, it's not for, for lack of trying or for lack of uh, effort. I mean, he, he's, he's going to put in the time. He's going to put in the work. Uh, he might have some physical limitations that are going to hold him back in his career. Uh, it's very possible. But uh, if there's a way for him to overcome that, I, I think he has those intangibles to make it happen. Yeah, I, I agree. I think he's going to get everything out of his potential that he can. I mean, he will – you know, and whether that's enough or not, I think we'll we'll find out. And, and um, 
it's going to be hard for him to improve as much as he did from year one to year two over the next year. But, um, you know, it is his first time since high school being in the same offense two years in a row. They're going to get him more weapons. Um, you know, so there, there's, you know, the, 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 uh, the opportunity for, I would say dramatic and significant improvement is there. And if that happens, like if you look at Jalen Hurts' best games, you look at it, you know, you take his five best games from last year. If he played on that level for 12 games, I mean, everyone's going to have some bad games. I mean, everybody, so, uh, you know, I mean, you know, every quarterback does, Brady, Rodgers, whoever. But if he can play on that level for three quarters of the season, he's your guy. Because we've seen him for short stretches play at a really, really high level, but it's that consistency that's been missing. If he can get to that point, you've got your quarterback. So, you know, we'll see. I mean, the, the it, it's there. I mean, there's there's something special there. Uh, we just got to see it more consistently. Um, I, I, you know, as much as you know, the, the thought of like Russell Wilson in the Eagles uniform is is pretty cool. You know, it's. Like that would be pretty well. It'd be like you know, seeing James Harden the first game last Friday. It's like I just don't believe I'm seeing this. I like you know, there's a few times like seeing T.O. the first time in an Eagles uniform or Michael Vick, something like that. But I'm excited to see Jalen Hurts and and what he can do uh, if he gets this next year, which it sure looks like he will. I'm, you know, I, I, there's something about watching a young guy like him develop. I mean, and. Um, if it doesn't work out, it doesn't work out. But um, part of me, you know, really wants to see uh, where he can go with this. Yeah, I think we're looking at it, honestly, the way most fans should look at this it, as a wait and see type of deal. And that doesn't prevent you from looking around and figuring out, like, look, yeah, if Russell Wilson becomes available, I think the Eagles will be crazy not to at least entertain the idea of, of trying to trade for him. But, um, when you look at her, look, I'm skeptical. I am. I, I'm skeptical that he'll be able to improve enough to the level I think he needs to be to become an elite quarterback and to give the team the best chance to be a perennial Super Bowl contender. Skeptical. But I also think that it's not completely out of their own possibility he can become that player. You know, so I, I think it, you really have to just see what happens in his career. I, I, we don't know how it's going to go. You can look at him and say he doesn't have the pure physical abilities that are going to make him be that player, but I don't know that. I don't. I don't know if anyone knows that. I think there are things he needs to clean up. I mean, he clearly, mechanically, he needs to clean some things up. Um, and, look, he doesn't have a Josh Allen arm. He doesn't have that rocket launcher. But I, I, I really do think his arm is strong enough to make the throws. A lot of it comes with anticipation. You know, is he going to throw the ball, you know, 60 yards down the field? Maybe not. But if he releases the ball a second earlier, he can hit a guy in stride and he can make a big play. So I think some of those things are going to come with time and maybe they never come. Maybe we're talking about this in a year and we say, we didn't see the growth we needed to see. It's time to change course. But until then, I, I kind of understand what they're doing. Yeah. And, you know, Keeping Jalen Hurts means not giving up draft picks, having more cap room. I mean, so much goes into it. You know, being able to improve the team around him more than you would otherwise, no matter what what you give up. Um, uh, you, you touched on the arm strength thing, and that's something that that Nick spoke about. I, I I really believe I'm with you. I think that's overrated. I think the arm strength thing is overrated. He has a good. He has an NFL arm. Yeah, you know, he doesn't have uh, a howitzer. He doesn't have a, a Michael Vick arm. Um, but you don't need that. You don't need I me, mean, but you do have to be accurate. And that's, that's where he's got to get better, uh, thrown behind guys, thrown with anticipation. Saw it sometimes, not enough. Uh, but, you know, I was looking at this, like, I mean, Drew Brees won a Super Bowl without completing a pass longer than 16 yards, you know, um, but he completed 70% of his passes or probably more than that in, in the Super Bowl. Um, there haven't been a lot of you look at the winning quarterbacks in Super Bowls that haven't thrown a lot of deep balls. It's not, you know, so um most like 70 yard touchdowns are like, you know, like a a short catch and run. Now there's there are bombs and everything that happens, but um you can win with a good arm. 
And Nick spoke a lot about Jalen's arm strength. He says it's it's quite good enough to win in the NFL. Um, they don't see it as a liability. And I tend to agree. I, I think if, you know, if, if you don't have elite arm strength, though, you really have to be more accurate than he is. And, um, you know, because you you can't fire it into that, that really small window. Um, you know, the window, I mean, as your arm strength decreases, the window gets smaller, I guess is what I'm saying, because the ball's getting there a little later. Um, and, the way corners are these days, they're, you know, they're, they're going to make a play on you. So he's got to be, he's got to be more accurate. Um, he went from 51 to 62% this year. And um, that was with one starting receiver who they got nothing out of. So um, if he can get that number from 61 to 65, uh, you know, you, you're where you want to be. And that's, you know, what four completions every, Hundred passes, so yeah. you know that's that's where he's got to be. But he he's got to do it. It's it's going to be, yeah. I, I'm with you. I mean, I, I wouldn't say I'm skeptical. I think I'm a little more bullish than you are. Um, skeptical, strong. I'm I'm curious to see how it pans out. I think uh, I think he's got a shot. I really do. Yeah, and you brought up a good point that if you don't have that elite arm strength, you have to make up for it. And and the easiest way is with accuracy. I wonder how they view his mobility. Like, I wonder if you can factor in that part of his game that is unique. But can that make up for it? Maybe not, because it, it doesn't really affect the way he throws, but it can. Like, we saw late in the season when he started to throw after being mobile. Like, early in the season, he was taking off, he was running, which is fine. But later in the season, we saw some growth in that area where he would – he would escape some pressure. He would take off and there'd be a five yard gain, five to 10 yard gain if he wanted it on the ground and he'd throw the ball and get a bigger gain. I wonder if that can factor in. I wonder if, because you need something else. Like if you're not going to have the arm strength, you need to you need to supplement your game with something else. And I agree with the accuracy is the number one way, but do you think mobility can be another way for him to supplement that? Yeah, there's no question. And his mobility can also make him more accurate because, you know, the, the, the threat and something Donovan was really good at was, um, you know, selling the run defenders would come up and that would leave somebody open or more open than they were. And then he would just toss it. And, um, the threat of the run sometimes is just as dangerous as, as the run itself. So that's something that takes some time to, to learn, you got to know where the line of scrimmage is and you got to, you know, be really aware of, of, you know, where, where the defense is, but it, it's, it's certainly something that he made strides in, but you know, he's still going to get better at, but um, yeah. I mean, how do you factor in, I mean, you're talking about 10 touchdowns and 750 rushing yards. I mean, you, and what was he, th- he had the third, like the third most rushing first downs. I mean, it's, it's, so the rushing numbers you have to take into account somehow. And, um, that's part of what can overcome. That's why I say 65%, maybe not 60. I mean, the, the league average is over 65% now. He doesn't have to be 67%, but uh, he's got to be higher than he is. Yeah. I couldn't get over the fact that where I was standing today listening to Howie Roseman talk about Jalen was the same spot the day before I heard Chris Ballard talk about his quarterback in a completely different way. It was The juxtaposition is just wild to me. Yeah, I, I still can't believe. I mean, we 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 went into detail about that on uh, Tuesday. I, I just can't believe. I mean, I just keep rereading the quotes. I, I and I, th- I think I texted you. I, uh, you know, he was he was harder on uh, his quarterback than Andy Reid was on Mike McMahon. I mean, like he, <laughs> I mean, you don't see a GM like just skewering one of his own player, any player like that. That's really rare. And like you said, I, I don't see any way the player can can recover from that bounce back. How do you play for this guy after he just, you know, what's the opposite of a, a vote of confidence? I mean, it just skewered him. Yeah. Uh, how about other things from Howie Rosen? You want to just ping pong this back and forth a little bit? What were some other takeaways from, from what he said? Well, you know, um, I thought his comments about Miles Sanders are really interesting. There's a sense out there that the Eagles are going to move on from him, trade him, uh, isn't part of the future. Be, you know, you're, 
they haven't given a second contract to a running back since Shady. Uh, it was quite some time ago. Um, but, you know, I think I wrote this in a column uh, a couple months ago. I, I see Miles in the same position as Goddard and Mulata. That whole class of 18 that was a year ahead of him, he's now going into that fourth year. Um, and I, I think he's going to get a new contract. I think they're going to make, you know, running backs don't cost a whole lot. He's really, really good. The problem has been staying on the field. Um, but, you know, he's he's a young guy. The production is unreal. I mean, he's got one of the 10 highest rushing averages in NFL history by a running back. I mean, you know, that's, you know, it's not an easy thing to replace. Um, so, I, you know, he was very bullish on Miles. And he even made that comparison about, you know, Goddard, Mulata, the, the you know, Sweat, um, the guys in that class of 2018. And uh, I, th- I guess Avante Maddox was the other one. I'm not sure you mentioned him. But um, they, those four guys all got extensions within a few weeks of each other, either late in the preseason or early in the season, going into year four. And for him to make that comparison tells you, in his mind, he's thinking, you know, as long as Miles has a good camp and he's healthy and, you know, that he's going to get it. He's going to get a deal. And I'm fine with that. Yeah. The difference to me between those four guys and Miles is I think it's, it's really tough to figure out the price for, for Sanders. I think the other ones, there was kind of a going rate for those positions, for those types of players. With Miles, it's like, first off, the running back position is weird in general because the contracts aren't very high and um, injury risk is real. And especially with this player in particular, I mean, he's been hurt so much. I, I don't know how you figure out the price. And that's the only reason I think there might be a little hold up on this because I, I, I don't know where you start, where you finish. Uh, I, do, you, do you try to extend him before the season or do you let him play the first half and, and show we can stay healthy, show we still as dynamic? I think that Miles understands that there's not going to be a huge free agency market for him if he gets to that point. Uh, I think he likes being here. Uh, I could be wrong, but I, I kind of feel like it's not going to be a really difficult thing. I think they can lowball him and, you know, he's going to get some bonus money that he can throw in the bank before he hits free agency and have that money and uh, not worry about injuries, you know, not worry about maybe if something happens. I'm not the same guy. Uh, and why, why wouldn't you? I would t- I would take that. I would take a lowball deal if I was Miles Sanders as I don't know exactly what my future is. And again, he's not that unusual. I mean, running backs, I was looking at the, uh, on NFL Jesus and the milestones, uh, not the milestones, the uh, Ironman category. And I believe there's only one running back in the league that started more than 10 games in a row. Like, like I mean, it's just guys, just guys, just, it, it's a, it, you know, but that's why the numbers, that's why the contracts are so low. And that's why you don't see a lot of guys getting that second deal. Uh, and they they just start bouncing around, you know, like, I mean, you know, you look at like um, Jordan Howard's career or Jay Ajay's career, I mean, young guys, and they just don't have anything left at, at a certain point. Um, or or the injuries just become too much to overcome. And, and they're, I mean, Jordan Howard's a two-time thousand-yard rusher who's on the practice squad. So um, I think you can lowball miles and, and keep them. And you're not going to take on a huge risk. And they have other backs if he does get hurt, but um, I th- I think he'll be here. Yeah, the lesson there is, kids don't don't play running back because the the money is not there. Yeah, I mean, like in my my mock draft, the first run I did the second round, and my first running back I was like pick number 40, 44. Like running backs don't get drafted in the first round; they don't get second contracts. You know, I mean. You look at guys like you know Todd Gurley. You know, get these guys go. For, they have that one great All Pro season. They're out of the league in two years. I mean, it's it's, yeah. it's crazy. Which is the argument against extending yeah. them in the first place. But that's something they'll have to but figure out. Price, right. If they get price. if they get the right price, then yeah. yeah. Uh, another thing from Howie that stood out to me. Uh, he basically said they're going to add edge rushers, which is obvious when you look at the roster, but uh they need to i mean he he was pretty blunt about their need to get better pass rush because uh, sack numbers being what they are sure maybe there's more to it than sack numbers but they do tell a good portion of the story and and they didn't have enough of them in 2021 they didn't have enough talent 
on the edge. They, they have some pretty good interior players, but they can't go into a season with Josh Sweat and Brandon Graham and think they're going to be fine. And it's a good draft for edge rushers. And it was kind of the first tacit acknowledgement that uh, Derek Barnett won't be here. I mean, we all mm-hmm. know that, but I mean, he's basically, that's basically what he's saying. Um, I don't think Ryan Kerrigan will be here either, uh, but, or, or Cameron Malvo. Um, but yeah. And it's funny because teams that don't get a lot of sacks, they, you know, they're like, well, sacks, sack numbers, you know, are what matters. But I guarantee you if the Eagles were third in the league in sacks and not 30th, they, they'd be up there saying, well, we have this many sacks. And, you know, <laughs> so it's a, it's a convenient stat to ignore if it doesn't favor you, but yeah, they, they've got to address it and they might, they might need to address it uh, a couple times. Yeah. I mean, it wouldn't surprise me to see them sign one. The problem is free agent rushers get paid a ton. They get overpaid even, uh, yeah. but it wouldn't surprise me to see them sign a guy and draft a guy. Or draft a couple guys. I yeah, mean, this is a good class for it. They could certainly do that. It's a good class for it. And that's how you avoid overpaying is drafting guys. And, you know, there's there's so many of them that I think there's going to be good value, like in the third round or, um, you know, I can't see them going first and second round, although it, <laughs> I wouldn't rule anything out. Um, but uh, I, I, I'd i expect them to – I mean, Sweat was a four, you know, so you can – you know, you can find guys, but uh, it's a position they need to revamp. I mean, if BG isn't like, I mean, we don't know, you know, I mean, he looks good walking around the parking lot and joking with us, but who knows? And if he can't contribute, now you're looking at Josh Sweat, who had a good half a season. And I know he went to the Pro Bowl. Good, good for him. But I mean, let's, let's be honest. He didn't do much the first half of the season. Um, had a good second half. Um, that's not enough. So it's, you know, it's, and they, they have not had great success drafting defensive ends. So uh, edge rusher. So it's, it's, I don't know if it's priority number one, but man, if it's not, it's really close. It's on the top of my list. When you yeah. look at their needs, I clear for me, it's, it's one. And then everything else is after it. It's, it's, it's clearly their top need. Yeah. How about anything else from Howie? Well, Howie was surprisingly blunt in his, his disappointment or frustration with the timing of uh, Ian Cunningham and Brandon Brown uh, leaving within a few days of each other. Um, Bears hired Cunningham as assistant GM uh, January 28th, and the Giants hired Brown. Um, Brandon Brown a few days later, February 7th, as their assistant GM. Um, and, you know, it's tough timing. I mean, they're, in a couple of ways. I mean, their they're departures – leave the Eagles without two of their top scouts uh, two months before the, you know, six weeks before the draft and, or six weeks before um, free agency and, uh, you know, a couple months before the draft. So it's, it's not ideal how we said, Oh, I can't replace them. We can't stop now and start restructuring our front office, you know, two weeks before free agency starts. Um he said he's, it, you know, it's – and now the, you got guys with the Giants and the Browns, two teams that picked before the Eagles, the Browns just a few picks before the Eagles, that know what how he's thinking. They don't know who he's going to pick, but they know his general thinking about players and about philosophy. And now they're, you know, running or, you know, involved in uh, in war rooms and in other – I shouldn't use that phrase right now, but in scouting rooms of other teams and – uh, so not only are the Eagles left without two guys they really value, they're both really good. You know, they're kind of like co-scouting directors um, where, uh, you know, Cunningham was more involved in college and Brown with uh, pro pro scouting, but they both kind of handled everything. They were both involved in everything. I mean, you can't do one without being involved in the other. And they were, they're really good, highly regarded guys. So um, it's tough in two ways because now you have your, you know, two rivals that know what you're thinking and you have your shorthand in your front office. So um, how he was very blunt about his disappointment in it. And um, I think he likes those guys personally. Um, he, he alluded to, um, we have to look at, let me see if I can find the quote here real quick. Um, you, I'm happy for those guys uh, cause they help themselves and their families, but it doesn't really help the Eagles, especially the timing of this, which is something maybe we have to talk about going forward about losing guys during this draft process. 
So I think he's kind of saying that the league needs to take a look at the timing that people can leave front offices. And I think that's a fair point. I guess there's not a good time no. to lose. Guys. And, and honestly, though, their free agent plan is already together. They're, they're so far into draft prep. I mean, I don't know if it really changes much. There, there is the element of other teams knowing their strategy and what they're thinking, but what are you going to do? I, I, he, I also think there's a very real possibility. We just see internal hires. It seems like that's the way they like to do this. And that might frustrate some fans. Uh, but that's kind of their MO is to, to promote those front office positions. I would think Catherine Raich maybe moves into one of them. She's probably ready for that. And the other bit we haven't even talked about on the pod is that Andy Weidel, interviewed for the Steelers GM job. I mean, it's bad enough losing Brown and Cunningham. If they lose Andy Weidel, I mean, then you're talking about you really have to to figure it out. And then you probably do have to go outside to hire someone. Yeah, I would agree with that. And the good thing about that is that wouldn't be till after the draft. Kevin Colbert's uh, staying mm-hmm. um, until after the draft. I, I think all this stuff should happen after the draft. I think all any scouting moves should, should happen once the draft is over with. Um, but do you know my connection with Kevin Colbert? Have I ever told you? I, I've known Kevin Colbert for for 40 years, over 40 years. He was the no, ass- I don't think so. Kevin Colbert was the assistant baseball coach at Ohio Wesleyan. Uh, no, he's assistant football coach to his brother, Bob. Bob Colbert was the football coach. He was assistant, but he was the head baseball coach. Um, Kevin, Kevin Colbert. was. Kevin was, yeah. He was a, he was the baseball coach uh, my last couple of years at Ohio Wesleyan. And uh, – you know, and then obviously he he worked his way up with the Steelers and became really a very highly regarded GM. But um, you know, he was uh I mean, I was doing the games on the radio on like the local college radio station, like interviewing him, like, you know, after the games, you know. Kevin, you get your bullpen gave up 16 runs to Marietta. You know, you're looking for more from the bullpen. Yeah, Rube, you know, I you know, now he's like <laughs> he's like this famous GM. But yeah, we go back, we go back a long ways. And actually I'm supposed to get him an Ohio Wesleyan hoodie. Last time I saw him, we played him in a preseason game. I can't remember last year, two years ago, but um, he, he wanted an Ohio Wesleyan hoodie. So I got to – maybe when we're out in uh, in Berea for joint practices, I can make a run down to Ohio Wesleyan. It's about an hour south of there. Get a hit up the bookstore, get Kevin a – and actually, Nick Sierra wanted one too. So I'll trade a, a Mount Union hoodie for an Ohio Wesleyan one. But <laughs> – uh, like yeah, Kevin's a great guy, and he's had a really good run there. You don't see a lot of GMs in that position that long, and uh, and Andy Weidel is a pretty good candidate to you know to fill that job. Yeah, and it's got to probably be like a dream job for Andy, who's from Pittsburgh. I mean, a, a chance to go home and be the GM there, it, it would it would fit, and it would really hurt the Eagles. It really would. It, it would be tough to replace him because he was kind of the. Obviously, he he replaced Joe Douglas, who left a few years ago, and they felt really comfortable with him in that role. They felt like they were kind of grooming him. I don't know if they have that right now. No, I think that's fair. And and uh, you know, Andy came over here with with Joe from um, Baltimore. Maybe was it a year? I think he brought him in a year later. Maybe, but no, they, they, they came, came together. together. Yeah, that's right. And they they you know they were both under you know obviously under um, Ozzy Newsom, who's as good as anybody in this business. So um, yeah, he's, he's a really valued guy. And, you know, and then there's like Tom Donahoe, who I was trying to figure out how old he is, Like it's not published anywhere, but he's got to be in his mid to late seventies. Right. Yeah. That timeline adds up. Yeah. So like he graduated college, I think in 68. So if he was 22, he was born in 46 would make him um, 76 somewhere around there. So, um, you know, he's, he's not really, I mean, he's in the front office, but, and then there's, you know, there's, um, Caldwell who I'm not sure, you know, I mean, he's been a GM. I'm not sure, you know, where he fits into all this Dave Caldwell, but, um, you know, we all, you know, people laughed when Jeff Lurie made that comment about, you know, being a GM factory or whatever it was, but we got some good people that, that other teams obviously are interested in. Yeah, uh, there were the two hires. There were other interviews. So you're right. I mean, they and they take pride in that being a pipeline. The problem is you lose, you lose them because there's only so far they can go in this organization. Yeah, and they're facing that now. So 
That's tough. What else? Anything else from Howie? Uh, Andre Dillard. Uh, he was asked about Dillard potentially being a trade chip. And I thought the way he handled it was typical Howie. It was it was a good move. He, he talked up Dillard and how good he thinks he can be. Then he also said he's valuable to us because we need depth. You know, we played all these offensive linemen last year. Guys get hurt. So that's classic Howie going. This guy is available, but telling everyone it's not going to come at a cheap price because we're happy to keep him. We're happy to keep him here and let him be a backup, and we'll play him if someone gets hurt. Uh, that's my take on. Is that the way you saw it? Yeah, exactly. And he also he also threw in that the um, characterization of him as only a left tackle is unfair. Um, mm-hmm. I think we're going to see. I think if Dillard's here in August, we'll see him at you know cross training at right tackle, maybe even a guard. Probably not, but maybe. Um, you know, just to and I'm sure he'll be playing that in the preseason. It was funny because how he how he said, you know, you need you need depth. We 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 had 15 different starting offensive linemen this year, and I'm thinking about it. I'm like, no, you didn't. And he said, well, I'm kind of cheating a little because we started five different guys for the last game against Dallas. I was like, you know, yeah, that's cheating. The Raven Clark and uh, mm-hmm. um, who else? Uh, you know, it was like uh, anyway, it was practice squad guys, uh, but. I think Tom McHale started, uh, but yeah, uh, Howie's really, really shrewd at that kind of stuff, and and uh, I think they're going to trade Dillard. I think in our stay and go, I had him go, and I think they're going to get something for him. Yeah, I do too. It makes it just makes too much sense. No, I, I I don't think they should give him away, but there's some pretty bad O line play in this league, and if they can get, I think, what do you think they can get for him? Two ones and a three. <laughs> Um, I mean, I would take a four, you know, I'm not sure. I was thinking that like an early day three pick. Yeah. I'm not sure you can get more than a four, but I'll take a four. Maybe conditional four. Maybe conditional four. Um, like if he's going to compete for a job somewhere, if he starts X amount of games or, or it becomes a three, if he, if he learns how to play right tackle, (laughs) (laughs) but yeah, I would, I would, uh, yeah, I would certainly take a four for him. I mean, you don't want to trade a, a guy that cost you a one for a four, but Jordan Mulata, look, he's going to be this team's left tackle for a long time. So, uh, and it's not a reason to not do it now. That was four years ago. Right, right. Well, it was three years ago, but it was four drafts ago, I guess. Okay. Just, you know, in the interest of accuracy for our Eagle Eye uh, uh, watchers and viewers and listeners, I just want to make that clear. But I think, I think Diller can play. I mean, Bengals could sure use better with the Bengals were running out there. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, and, and we've seen it across the league. I mean, he, he's better than some starting tackles. So if the Eagles can get something for him, they should do it. No doubt. Uh, the, the last thing I want to talk about, for, it was really from Howie and Nick. They keep talking about Quez Watkins. I, I think they actually like him. And, and look, I, I don't know if, if he's going to be a legit number two, but they certainly think he is. I mean, they think he's going to get much better. And there's reasons to – to really like Quez. He's obviously the speed's there, but I mean, he played the slot this year. He didn't play the slot in college. So for him to have the year he did in the slot out of position because they kept forcing another guy into the offense for no reason, I, they, they're bullish on him and we'll see if he pans out the way they think, but they're looking at him like a legitimate number two receiver. Uh, No doubt. Are are we not saying his name now? The first round pick from 2020? (laughs) I didn't want to pile on. <laughs> uh, yeah, I and I think, look, this is when you get a sick – I know he's got limita- – not limitations, but he's got things he has to work on. We saw him give up on some plays. Um, this is a six-round pick. You know, this is a uh, – what is he, 24 now, a six-round pick. You, you get a guy at any position in the sixth round, he's not going to be a finished product. He, he just isn't. And – he, what you know? What he's giving this team already? I mean, he had did he have over? He had over seven hundred yards as a you know as a six round pick and a first year star. Remember, he didn't even get on the field last year to the last last few weeks, so he wasn't a rookie, but he was essentially a rookie. Um, I think the sky's the limit for him. I, and he's got good hands. Um, he's tough. Um, he's just got to work on you know a, a few a few little things. I mean, he, he did give up on some plays. We just see him you know, stop running for some reason or break off his route, uh, you know, and um, he's got to get better. But um, I'll tell you what, I think they have something in him. I think ideally he's a three and 
we'll see what they do in free agency and, and the draft. Um, but, you know, if, if he, you know, I, th- I think there's, there's a thousand yard receiver there um, potential. I, I really do. Yeah. And, um, it's been a long time since they had two young receivers that you get excited about. Yeah, he actually had 647 yards just in the sake of uh, accuracy there for our, <laughs> I was our including, viewers and listeners. I was including what he did in the postseason. Oh, okay. Sure you I were. Was, I think it was <laughs> over 700, including the playoffs and preseason. <laughs> and uh, just- and, and <laughs> the last little thing we wanted to talk about from uh, – was, this was from Nick's press conference. He said he's hopeful Kelsey returns, and it's really been pointing this way. I, I'd imagine we're going to hear news pretty soon. Last year, it came on March 5th. We're recording this on March 2nd. I'd have to think we're going to hear pretty soon, and I anticipate he'll be back. Yeah. Um, Nick said, I think he said, I'm hopeful, or something something mm-hmm. like that. Um, had had the keg, the keg delivered. Uh, that's enough. That would keep me going for another year. Have a keg. Um, I think Jason was legitimately enjoyed this year. He he likes well. He likes winning. Um, I you know. I, but I think he likes what this team is all about. And the, the, he he likes the guys he plays with. Um, we know he loves his coach, his position coach Stout. Um, yeah, I mean I, I'm. I know one thing. I mean, Jason told me once, I don't play this game. Because I, I said, you know, if you play a few more years, you're Hall of Fame. He's like, no, I don't care about that stuff. I, I don't I don't play this game for awards. I don't play this game for Pro Bowls or All Pros, Hall of Fame. I don't play for that. He said, that stuff's nice. But I, I play because I love what a bunch of guys can do together, uh, working together. Uh, I just I, – I love being part of a team. And I think he really likes this team. He likes this this O-line. Uh, I think he likes Jalen. I think he likes Nick, and I think he wants to be a part of this. But you know, he has two little kids now. He's got other interests. Um, at the end of every season, we see him limping around the Novacare complex. He's thirty-four now, so I still think he'd go either way. But selfishly, I hope he's back because he's so much fun to watch. Yeah, I, I think he went into last season pretty much thinking this was it, that was going to be his last year. And then you're right. I think things change. I think he had way more fun than he anticipated. I think the team was better than he probably thought they were going to be. And honestly, he didn't get hurt this year. I mean, he got banged up here and there, but he came out of the season much healthier than he has really the last few years. So he's feeling good. He, he likes the situation. It's going to take a new contract, but that shouldn't be so hard. I mean, they know what he's worth and they're going to pay him. So yeah, I, I think he's going to be back. Yeah. It's hard to imagine. I mean, they could put Sam Malo at center. I think that's what they would do, and I think he'd be fine. But it's hard to imagine this team without Jason Kelsey. I mean, it's it's been a decade of excellence, and uh, it's going to be whenever he does hang him up, it's going to be strange. Yeah, and and they're going to have to figure it out at some point. He's not going to play forever, but I think in twenty twenty two, they'll be set. We might know by the next podcast. That's very true. Uh, the last thing we wanted to talk about today, uh, it kind of made its rounds uh, earlier in the day when we were talking to a bunch of prospects. Uh, the Eagles have brought a, a little basketball hoop with them, a little toy basketball hoop, and they're making prospects take five free throws, kind of as an icebreaker to start. Based on what we know about Nick and the way he likes to do things, this is not a surprise at all. If anything, it's an upgrade from rock, paper, scissors. Yeah, no doubt. Somebody tweeted to me the Sixers should have done that before they drafted Ben Simmons. <laughs> yeah, the jokes write themselves there. Yeah, they? they really do. Yeah. Uh, but um, yeah, I, I think it, I mean that stuff is great. Uh, you know, it's it's an icebreaker. Um, you're not going to not draft somebody because they missed some foul. You know, not draft an offensive guard because he missed some foul shots. I wonder if it's the same Papa shot they had in the locker room two years ago or three years ago. I guess it was. No, this is a little one. Uh, he actually said it's a uh, has a Villanova backboard on it. Oh yeah, he did say that. Yeah, he's become a Villanova fan. Yeah, he has. Well, you know, Villanova, um, I believe, is on pace to break the Division One record for highest free throw percentage in history. I believe Harvard has the record. 
their their, their season free throw percentage is something like 82.8 percent. Uh, although they missed a couple against Providence, they you know it really cost almost cost them. But um, I don't want to get too deep into that. But um, Sean McDermott was at was in the Villanova locker room in Buffalo uh, when when uh, Villanova played up there in the I guess it was a Sweet Sixteen a few years ago. So I don't know what that has to do with anything. But you were like, I don't want to get too deep into it. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, but uh, no, I, I got no problem with it. I think it's it's a fun thing. You know, you're trying to you're just trying to get these guys to relax. You're trying to get them to um, show a little more of themselves. You know, they're so prepped and they're so everything is so planned out and 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 rehearsed and scripted. So you're just trying to get these guys to let their guard down a little bit and uh, something like that. But I've always said. If I was hiring people for any kind of job, I would have them play Tetris. I would watch them play Tetris. I think you learn more about somebody by, like, you know, their their ability to, you know, think quickly and and in abstract, concrete ways. I play Tetris. Watch them play Tetris. Same kind of thing. You know, you, you learn a lot about somebody like that. Yeah, I, I just think about you. You know, twenty one year old kid. It's it's a very stressful week. They have so much yeah. riding on this, and if they're nervous like you'd understand and you walk in and you're saying here's a basketball take some shots yeah i mean that would put me at ease at that age it would put me at ease now <laughs> yeah yeah uh yeah i got no problem with it i think it's fun yeah you got anything I, else for wrap this up no no uh, have you been to uh uh what, what is it uh steak and shake yet I have not. Uh, I'll, maybe I'll try to get there. I had a big lunch today, so maybe I'll I'll do that for dinner. Sounds good. Give me yeah. one of their giant iced teas, man. They have the best iced tea, and their cups are these are like 128 ounce cups. So you just get one of those. You bring it over to the workroom, and you're set for the day. I'll put it in the mail for you. That works. I appreciate that. <laughs> <laughs> if you enjoy the Eagle Eye podcast, please do us a favor, rate and subscribe wherever you get your pods. If you're watching on YouTube, please click the like button and subscribe there as well. That's it for Ruben Dave. We'll talk to you soon.